Do you found the skeleton? How would you, how would you tell people that you found it? You first, first, first. How would you tell them? Well, interesting question. I don't know. I don't know. I'm research on that. Hey there YouTube, the Dapper Dinosaur here. Today I'm looking at a brand new anti-evolutionist. Now, this one isn't Christian, and so I'm not going to give him a label like Young Earth Creationism that implies he fits into those rather Christian categories of creationism we're all familiar with. I also have no idea how old he thinks the universe, Earth, or life are, but I can tell you he's not buying into evolution. The man of the hour is David Gottlieb. Now, he's going by Rabbi Dr. David Gottlieb. But the only person going by that that I can find outside of YouTube goes by David with an O instead of an A. And it turns out, that's the same guy. His website is in fact davidgottlieb.com, no space, and with an O. But in this video, as in all the other videos on this channel, he's listed as David. Either way, this is part of a series called Jewish Philosophy, and I haven't seen any of the rest of it, nor is this a criticism of Jewish philosophy broadly. Like all religions, Judaism is a diverse thing and contains people who do and do not deny science and who do and do not believe in God, etc. This video is about the ideas presented by David in a single video and nothing else. Anyway, here's David. Um, I realize the title that I, that I wrote is not quite accurate. The many failures of the theory of evolution would take six or seven hours to do thoroughly. I haven't got time to do all of them. So maybe a better title would be Some of the Many failures of evolution, and... I get the distinct impression that what he thinks of as the failures of evolution are actually his failures to understand evolution. Instead of just racing through about 15, um, what I'd rather do is uh, try to explain one after another in a slow and thorough fashion so that it will be understood. Well, we've got slow down. Instead of just forming an impression, gosh, there's a lot of stuff out there, uh, maybe you'll understand what the problems are, and uh, that way you'll have some understanding, you can share it with others. It might be better than just uh, racing through a whole bunch. I actually agree. I think focusing on a small number of issues in detail is probably better than just shotgunning claims. There are two different kinds of problems that you can raise for a position, proposition. Somebody says, here's my position, here are the reasons for it, I think it's correct, and I think I have adequate reason to defend it, substantiate it. There are two different ways that someone can respond critically. One way is to say, you're wrong. I know what you think, but you're wrong, and I can show it to you, I'll prove to you that you're wrong. The other way is to say, I don't know whether you're wrong or right but your reasons aren't good reasons for your position. The truth is you don't know that you're right. And when you appreciate that your reasons aren't good reasons, then what you should do is say, gee, I thought, but now I really don't know. The critic may not know either. He just may be able to show you that your reasons aren't good reasons. Jeez, that might be the most long-winded way to say one way to respond critically to a claim is with counter evidence. Okay, he's going to keep rambling a bit. We'll cut back in when he makes a new point. Second type of critique, the guy says, I know it's true because I read it in Britannica, and I ask him, would you please take a look at the date of the Britannica you read? He looks at it, he says, oh, it's 1982. And I say, look, <laughs> it's 2014. Lots of things change in that period of time. I don't know whether it's right or wrong, but relying on the 1982 Britannica is not good evidence. It's not a good reason to, to accept it. So yeah, this is another ramble that comes out to the second way to respond critically to a claim is to not offer counter evidence, but to point out that the evidence used by the claimant is insufficient to warrant acceptance of the claim. And he's right. Those are basically the ways to respond to claims critically, although they're not exclusive. I think is excellent critique of the latter kind that Evolution in its present condition can't claim to have good reasons. Yeah, we definitely don't have things like taxonomy, morphology, genetics, the twin nested hierarchy, population genetics, and of course, the fossil record. Yeah. 
should present it to others if they have an, ob an obligation and responsibility to accept it as true. There's also some evidence against its truth. I wouldn't say the evidence against its truth is conclusive, but it definitely should um, make a person less sure, and then it contributes to the first conclusion that you haven't got good enough evidence to accept it as, as correct. Well, I am greatly looking forward to this evidence. It'll be the first such I've ever encountered, and I'm sure that the good doctor has some such evidence for us. He probably won't provide things that just aren't true or don't contradict evolution because he just doesn't know enough about biology to tell the difference. And yes, this guy not being someone with a degree or evident training in the relevant fields is more likely to be ill-informed than dishonest. Maybe it's possible, but I haven't got the information to accept it. I don't know whether it's true or not. And that will be a gigantic revolution for a whole population of people who either honestly believe they know it's true or pretend to believe that because otherwise it'll lose their jobs. Well, I definitely am in one of those categories, although which I'll leave up to your interpretation. Okay, now the, the first remark in this, in this regard, and I think this is in a way the most powerful, it's simple, it's direct, and I'll uh, put it to you with a couple of examples and then I'll apply it to the evolution case. Get on with it. Yes, get on with it. Get on with it. I invite you to a demonstration. In this demonstration, there's a thin pole with a swivel, and on top of the swivel is a, is, a, is a revolver, a gun. And the gun can swivel 360 degrees. If you give it a twist, it will go round and round. 50 yards away, there's a target, a circular target, one foot in diameter. And I show you the following demonstration. I twist the gun, and it goes round and around, and then it shoots once and hits the target. I do that five times. Each time I twist it, and it goes round and around, shoots once and hits the target all five times. What a perfect analogy for evolution. But OK, let's hear him out. And I say, would you like to know how it does that? And you say, yeah, I'd like to know how it does that. How does it do that? I'll tell you how. The gun has in it a laser beam. And the target has a reflector to the laser beam. And it has a hair trigger so that when it gets a reflection back from the laser, it fires. And in that way, it's, it's, uh, it's designed and it's machined to shoot just when it's going to hit the target. And that's why it hit the target five times in a row. OK. I'm offering that to you as an explanation. Just offering it. That's case one. Case two, you ask me, how does it do that? And I tell you this. I'll tell you how it does it. I just spin it. Now there's a timer on it, which times it to shoot. The timer is set to a random number generator, so it just makes it shoot at random. And when I spin it, it spins at random. And it hit the target five times in a row by accident. By accident. Those are the two explanations I offer you. Yeah, the laser one seems more likely. But if we had a room with, say, 500 million force multipliers and 500 million targets, and all of them were spun at once, and all of them discharged once, then you take five targets which were all hit and ask me if that could be something that happened by chance. And you know what? Yeah, probably is. In fact, we could calculate the chances using things like trigonometry and the law of perspective. The real one, not the flurf one. Oh, and you know what? What the heck, let's do it. So there's a target 50 yards away. Now, those vary in size, but let's say it's 17 inches, which is the smaller size of some targets I found on Amazon. 
And yeah, we're using inches since apparently we're using Imperial today. That means that the angular size of the target from the force multiplier is 0.54112 degrees, or 32.467 arc minutes. The rotation is 360 degrees, so we do some quick math and divide 360 by 0.54112, so the chances of hitting the target randomly in any given shot are 1 in about 665.3. That means that in my 500 million example, we should actually expect to see more than 750,000 targets hit. The law of large numbers is pretty cool, isn't it? Now, I think your attitude ought to be, well, the first one's credible. Yeah, seems like it. Also, this is a very dangerous experiment we're running here. Don't swing force multipliers around, people. You don't know if it's true or not. Maybe I'm just lying. Maybe something else is going on. But if there really is a laser going out, there's a reflector, and lasers are almost instantaneous at that distance, and then there's a hair trigger to it, that's a mechanism that could do it. That's a plausible explanation. By accident? Five times in a row? 50 yards? One foot in diameter? Oh, I must have missed that it was one foot in diameter. That changes the chance to hit to 1 in 942.5 or so, and the number of expected hits in 500 million to 530,000. That's not going to happen. Now, wait a minute, that's not going to happen. It could happen by accident. It could. Just to figure the chances are 1 in 10 trillion. Actually, it's 1 in 42 octillion, a lot worse than 10 trillion. And that's not a credible explanation. To say something happened by accident where the probability is 1 in 10 trillion is just too unlikely to accept. Okay, now let's connect that back to evolution somehow because evolution is very much nothing like this thought experiment, as far as I can tell. I think if you offer the second explanation, the, the right response is, I can't accept that. It's just too unlikely to be true. It's got to be something else. I can't take that seriously. I hope this is ABCs. And if it's not ABCs, then suppose I spin it around 25 times in a row. No matter how many times you do it, it's math, not spelling. But yeah, the math is pretty basic, probably high school level. Right? Then, the, the, then the probability that it was one septillion. Right? Whatever it is, at a certain point, you're going to say, it's too unlikely to be true. I take that to be obvious. Okay, that's step, step two. Another case. I, I have an object, and on... What the heck, man? We're just off to some other thought experiment? What did the target have to do with evolution? Was it supposed to be mutation? Selection? Drift? Horizontal gene transfer? I guess the world may never know. One side of the object I've painted an X. Now, I tell you, I threw the object into the air, and three times in a row it landed on the X. And I tell you, it landed on the X by accident. I didn't throw it in any special way. It's not weighted. It's not magnetized. There are no carvings in the object that catch the air currents and make it land on one side. It fell down three times in a row on the X by accident. Is that a plausible explanation? Depending on the object, yes. The answer is, I've left out one crucial piece of information, which you may have sort of mentally filled in, because it's common, but I didn't say it. I didn't tell you how many sides the object has. Hence my depending on the object. You may have assumed it was a coin, in which case the probability is one-eighth. That's not outrageous. That happens 12.5% of the time. Suppose it's a shilly gun, which has a thousand sides. That means that the probability of throwing it to the air and getting it come down three times in a row on the X side is one in a billion. That's not reasonable. Sure, it's possible. The chances of winning the lottery are about 1 in 300 million. Winning twice has a chance of 1 in 900 billion. And yet, it's trivial to find verified reports of people who have won the lottery two or even more times. And the chances of rolling a particular value three times in a row on a thousand-sided die are 1,000 cubed, which is to say 1 in a billion. So if things that are less likely than 1 in 900 billion happen multiple times, then one person getting a 1 in a billion chance thing to happen to them isn't surprising. If rolling such dice were as common as playing the lottery, then we should expect there to be 900 people who've rolled that three times in a row for each person who has won the lottery twice. So a coin is reasonable, and a thousand-sided piece is not reasonable. Disagree. Suppose I don't tell you how many sides it has. I don't tell you then I can't meaningfully use the techniques of statistics to tell me how reasonable it is. But if I can get a good estimate on a range of possible sides, and I assume the worst, and get a good estimate of how many times the exercise is run, then I can at least get a ballpark figure. For example, if I find it reasonable that there have been 3 billion attempts, and I figure the number of sides is probably between 800 and 1200, then sure, 
having some people who roll that X thrice in a row is pretty likely. What should your attitude be towards my explanation that it happened by accident? Your attitude ought to be, you haven't given me enough information to make up my mind. Yup, that's why I had to make some reasonable assumptions to get an estimate. If the probability is reasonably high, I'll accept it as a plausible explanation. If the probability is uh, extremely low, I will not accept it as a plausible explanation. If you refuse to let me figure out what the probability it is, probability is, then you have not given me any, you haven't given me enough information to rationally make up my mind whether to accept it or not. I think that's ABC. Now the evolutionist community, and I use that word advisedly, evolutionism is another religion. Oh, does it have a community with rituals, practices, or beliefs that bind them into such a community? Nope. Not any more than the oxygen theory of fire or the germ theory of disease do. And interestingly enough, if it were a different religion, you'd think you'd have to leave a previous religion to join it. And yet there are Jewish, Muslim, Christian, Baha'i, Sikh, Hindu, Buddhist, etc. people who accept evolution. Almost like it's not a religion at all. The evolutionist community has been challenged Repeatedly, over decades, give us a probability. For what? Evolution happening? It's 100% because we watch it happen. We're seeing it happen right now in everything from viruses to bacteria to lizards to people. Give us a probability. Sometimes they've been challenged by people who think they can calculate the probability and show that it's very low. I think I'm skeptical about that. But give us a, prob a positive probability. Tell you what, I'll give a positive probability after rabbis give me one. Oh, for what, you ask? I don't know. I'm not telling you. Thomas Daigle, in his book, Mind and Cosmos, which came out last year, made the same challenge as many have made. No one has even offered such a probability. For what? No believer in evolution has even tried to present such a probability. No one has ever taken the challenge. It's hard for me to take a challenge when you won't tell me what the challenge is. But hey, let's meet this guy more than halfway and present an empirically backed probability for the common ancestry of all primates. According to the paper Statistical Evidence for Common Ancestry, Application to Primates by Baum et al., the chances that all primates do not share evolutionary common ancestry is 7 times 10 to the negative 1,791st power, according to at least one of their tests, and literally zero in 12 of their tests. So basically 100%. There you go. There's a positive probability just like Rabbi Gottlieb asked for. To give me a probability that what you say happened by accident really happened by accident the way you say it happened. I'm not telling you anything happened by accident. So yeah, this guy clearly doesn't know enough about evolution to critique it. He doesn't even know what the claim is, which is probably why his force multiplier and die roll examples make so little sense. So I think the very simple, clear, First conclusion at this point is, there isn't enough backing to the theory to accept it as true. I don't know, I feel like when your probability gets to the point that no one has named numbers that big, you can be pretty confident. You claim something happened by accident? No, I don't. In order to make up my mind reasonably whether to accept it or not, I have to know the probability. If you don't give me the probability, then there isn't enough backing to it to accept it as true. It might be true, I'm not saying it's false. But I certainly don't have to say, I have to agree that it's true. Well, again, how about a probability of 7 times 10 to the negative 1,791st that it didn't happen? Seems pretty good to me. Especially when I could cite the same paper and just say zero. Now, some people have uh, replied to this reasoning in the following way. Let's think what you're asking for. You're asking for probability that evolution is true. Evolution is a whole theory. It's not really true in the same sense as a singular proposition. A theory is an overarching framework in science that connects otherwise unconnected data and provides an explanatory framework to explain those data as well as predict future data in similar subsequent observations or experiments. As such, it's not strictly a proposition, although it contains proposition. It's kind of like asking, is the Torah true? It has things in it that are true, like the names of real cities, actual civilizations, etc. It also provides the ultimate source for the halakha which guides Jewish practice. So in some ways, yes, it's true.
but then it also contains characters like Abraham and Moses, who almost certainly did not exist in any meaningful way. But does that make it false? Kind of. Similarly, evolutionary biology contains many things that are true, such as that mutations happen, that selection happens, and that allele frequencies change in populations over time. It also provides the mechanism to explain common ancestry. It also contains things that aren't really true. Like, in many population genetics model, infinite population size and random mating are assumed, even though in real populations, neither of these things are true. So what does that mean for the theory of evolution? Well, it remains the single theory of biodiversity, it successfully predicts data, and parts of it, like universal common ancestry and the existence of the mechanisms of evolution, are so likely true that holding the contrary, while being well-informed, is basically insane. But is it true as a theory? Yes, in some ways, no in others. But the ways it's not true don't really help evolution deniers. Well, evolution is, is a picture of how you start with something that makes copies of itself, and then you end up with butterflies and sequoias and platypuses and coral reefs and who knows what. Yeah, but none of that is all by accident. There are non-chance elements to all of this, like natural and sexual selection. Evolution is contingent, but it's not accidental. Here's an example of something that is contingent, but not really accidental. This is a simulation of a reaction-diffusion interaction that I made in Blender. These reactions are really cool. They're how things like zebras, tropical fish, and giraffes get their patterning. Basically, there are two chemicals that are produced in various parts of the embryo that are antagonistic, inhibiting each other. And with the constant production and inhibition, you get cool patterns. Now, my simulation uses 4D Perlin noise. What that means is that I can change the starting conditions by sliding my initial noise texture along the fourth dimension. Then, when I perform the exact same simulation, it turns out differently. Was this an accident? Well, I don't think so, but it does have a random starting point. Now, this isn't exactly like how evolution works, but it does illustrate that processes that have random and non-random aspects can result in complex outcomes. But golly, starting from the first thing that made copies of itself, and arriving at our envelope of life, you're talking about millions or more of changes, each of which contributed to the development. That's true. To give you a probability of that happening, I'd have to know in some detail what each of the changes was. I'd have to know the conditions under which it took place, what's the uh, um, uh, intensity of cosmic rays in the area, and what was the temperature of the, the water, and uh, the, the salinity of the water, and other chemicals available, and what was the comp composition of the atmosphere, and this changing over billions of years. I don't know all of that. Yeah, and not only do we not know all of that, but even if we did, the probability of the exact form life has taken now in all its diversity is vanishingly small. But the system has to take a state. Let's perform a thought experiment to show how this works. The chances of any given order of cards in a 52 deck being the result of a perfect shuffle is 1 in 8.0658175 times 10 to the 67th power. That's really low. Now, let's say that you did a perfect shuffle and recorded the order of the cards, and then you did that four more times. Whatever you record, the chances of getting that exact sequence is 1 in 3.413830517669607 times 10 to the 339th power. So, does this mean that you can't have produced your record of cards via the mechanism of shuffling cards and then recording the order in which they were drawn? No, of course not. If you do this exercise, you have to get some sequence. The system must take some state. And pointing out how unlikely the state it took is compared to all the other states it could have taken means nothing. Any other state it could have taken is similarly unlikely. So what are the chances that evolution produced life as it exists now? Well, basically 100%. But if we reran it, what are the chances it would turn out the same way? I don't know, but it's almost zero. But the new directions in which life would evolve would be no less unlikely. I don't know all of that. Maybe we'll never know all of that. You're asking for something that's completely impossible to deliver. Okay, I hear you. It's impossible to deliver. What am I supposed to make of that? So what? So it's impossible to deliver. Then the follow-up is, well, that's unreasonable. It's unreasonable to ask people for things that are impossible to deliver. I don't see why. I don't see why, or rather, instead of asking you to deliver it, pointing out the consequences of not delivering it. You don't have information. To give me a probability, 
If you don't have a probability, there isn't reason to accept it. Now you say, but it's impossible to get a probability. No, it's not. We can get probability estimates from evolution all the time. This is science, which is all about probabilities. Now, our probability for all of evolution is probably not calculable, but we can get probabilities on things like whether a particular protein evolved from some other protein, whether a certain group of organisms share common ancestry, how many generations it will take for an organism to adapt to a new environment, etc. It's just that no one is going around aggregating all of them because that aggregate number doesn't really tell us anything useful. But of course, David here doesn't know how to investigate this. I would be surprised if he's ever read and understood a single paper published in a field relevant to evolutionary biology. And on its own, that's okay. Most people haven't. What's less okay is then pretending that that ignorance is on its own a good reason to reject science. And what's even less okay than that is thinking that you actually do have the knowledge it would take to assess the science better than the experts and take a contrary position to them. As an example, I'm not going to take a stance on the halachic requirements surrounding driving to a synagogue on a Saturday. Some rabbis hold it is forbidden, others that it is not. And I, being not just not an expert on halacha, but not even Jewish, certainly don't have the expertise necessary to make a determination on that. And so if someone tells me that their interpretation is something or another, I cannot disagree. Even if I can tell you what I prefer, if I were subject to this practice, which is that it be allowed. In the same vein, David has no business telling people what they should believe or not about science that he doesn't even understand. So then I say, then it will always be impossible to accept it. Because you need a probability in order to reasonably be required to accept it. You really don't, though. David here probably accepts or would accept that Saturn has 149 moons with confirmed orbits. What are the chances of that? I don't even know how to begin to answer that. Similarly, evolution is simply observed in many instances, and I don't know what the chances are that particular contingent events in the history of it occurred. But I can see it now, and there is ample evidence that it happened in the past. Not knowing the probability of something isn't on its own necessary or sufficient to believe that something has happened. This also occurs in history. What are the chances that Julius Caesar would be assassinated? I don't know, and I can't even imagine a way to calculate it. Does that mean I shouldn't believe he was assassinated? Of course not. And it's impossible to get one? Too bad! So much the worst for you! Then throw up your hands and say, this is hopeless. There are, after all, propositions in science that are hopeless. You believe in evolution, so you believe there was a first cell. Probably, although I could imagine more than one organism independently evolving a cell structure than having those independent evolutions persist to today, but that seems much less likely, so I do tend to believe that all cellular life evolved from a cellular ancestor. But then again, evolution is about populations, not individuals, so I'm not sure I believe in a singular first cell. Now I ask you, was that first cell in the northern hemisphere or the southern hemisphere? Not a clue. Not sure why it matters either. I think you're likely to say that's hopeless. It's just not enough information, not enough evidence available even in principle to determine where the first cell was. I mean, Earth, probably? But also, here's a picture of a jar of gumballs. Is the number of gumballs even or odd? Well, you can't tell. Does that mean that there is no jar of gumballs and that asking about the jar of gumballs is stupid? Well, no, of course not. The fact that not all questions about a topic are answerable doesn't mean that the questions about it that are answerable and that we have answers for can be ignored. For example, if I know the approximate packing density for spheres and I know the measurements of the gumballs and the volume of the container, I can tell you approximately how many gumballs are in there. Even if I can't tell you that the number that is actually there and is within my margin of error is even or odd. There will always be questions about evolution and the origin of life that will never be answered. That doesn't mean that the answers we do have are false. Another example is that I don't know what my mother's mother's mother had for breakfast on her 8th birthday. That doesn't mean I don't have a great-grandmother. Okay, then you don't know. If you don't know, don't tell me it was definitely a Southern Hemisphere. I won't, and I really don't think anyone else has either. I'm pretty sure this is just a complaint about a straw man. It's like when Kent makes up a Berkeley professor or a museum tour guide to be his foil in a story that never happened. Now, I'm not saying that this guy is anywhere close to as scummy as that felon. Just confess you don't know. I already did that. Not sure what else is needed. If it's impossible to get the information, then you'll never know. Life is like that. The world is like that. There's some things we'll never know. Too bad. Maybe we'll never know whether evolution is true or not. And there are other things that we can know, and one of them is that universal common ancestry is true, and that the mechanisms of evolution can and do work on extant life, meaning they probably also operated on life in the past. 
So then we'll never know it. Now, one more quip, uh, just one more, uh, make sure we're talking the same language. And then if you have questions about this, I'll be happy to discuss it. I think, I think this is like, like the, it's like a master argument. Now, this is not my argument. I just thought up the examples because I'm into education and communication. But um, What is happening right now? The word evolution uh, has many different meanings. Yes, like many words. Language is like that. But when we're talking about the theory of evolution in biology, it is rather restricted to change in allele frequencies in a population over multiple generations and the effects thereof. Ernst Meyer, professor emeritus at Harvard, I assume he's still alive. He died in 2005 at the age of 100. I don't know when this video was made, but given that it's about an hour long and that YouTube didn't really like that in 2005, I'm going to guess he was no longer alive when this video was made. Although I suspect that this is unimportant to the point being made. Uh, true believer in evolution and one of the field's best expositors. He also has a taste for philosophical thinking. Uh, he wrote uh, books and, and essays, which I found very instructive. He has an essay on the different meanings of the word evolution, and this can cause real confusion. Uh, if I remember correctly, I remember five different meanings. I think other people say there are more. So it's just one of those things you've got to keep in mind. Evolution sometimes means things have changed. They haven't always been the same. Yes, we mean that when we talk about the evolution of the solar system, the evolution of dance, or the evolution of the alphabet. Things have got bigger, something's gotten smaller, something's went extinct, some new species appeared. Things have not always been the same in terms of what life there is. That's the simplest. Um, there was a 19th century German biologist whose name escapes me at the moment, who said, and it's been quoted hundreds of times, Evolution is as obvious as that the Earth goes around the sun. I actually like that and agree. In that it's not immediately obvious just from looking around within a single human lifetime without measurement tools or without the ability to travel widely. And that's why for most of the time that humans have been around, people defaulted to geocentrism and species fixity. But as we start to learn more and more about the world around us and gather observations from around the world and through time, it became more and more clear that these assumptions simply did not hold up to scrutiny. Then later, we could do things like measure the orbit of the Earth, measure the rate of evolution, confirm the orbit via stellar parallax, and common ancestry via genetics. Now, heliocentrism came earlier than evolutionary biology, but it's still a very good comparison. What almost nobody knows, and Meyer points this out, when he said evolution is obvious, what he meant was things have changed. They haven't always been the same. Is that what he said? I wish I could take this guy's word for it, but given that there's no citation, and given how much experience I have with anti-evolutionists misrepresenting their quotations, I simply cannot take his word for it. In fact, I think it's more likely than not that he's wrong about this. That's a reasonable statement. The, the fossils, even within our time span, the fossils shows market changes in the, in the types of life that, uh, that uh, exist on the planet. Anybody who holds that life has never changed is someone who um, just is saying something that's pretty obviously wrong, maybe as obvious as the fact that the Earth goes around the sun. I think this probably means he's not a young Earther, which is good. Then the second meaning of evolution is the changes have taken place gradually. I actually would include that in the first definition. A rapid and sudden change isn't normally something I'd call evolution. Like if I were describing the evolution of, say, some ritual in some religion, and then one day everyone just completely altered the way they did it, like, if all Christians decided that actually the Eucharist was going to be Cheetos and Mountain Dew, I would not call that part of the evolution. I would call that a break in the evolution. By the way, I have seen a Christian argue in good faith that Doritos and grape soda could be Eucharistic elements, although he stopped short of advocating for them to be used as such. Evolution as opposed to revolution, where things change to take place rapidly. That's not obvious. The fossil record does not support that. Um, some places it doesn't support it. Inglorious? Wait, the fossil record doesn't support gradual change? In what universe? We have plenty of intermediate fossils showing the relatively slow progress of organisms. In fact, look, here are a bunch of them.
Great detail, like flowering plants that appear in the fossil record with no antecedents, like insects that appear in the fossil record with no antecedents. Oh no, if only Archifrutus and Rhinoyognatha didn't exist, he might be right. Except that they do. Oh well. Correct, it did not. In fact, even in The Origin of Species, Darwin thought that life went back to one or a few original forms. It turns out that universal rather than limited common ancestry is well supported. It didn't have to be that way, and it's still possible we could find life on Earth, or more likely elsewhere, that does not share common ancestry with the rest of life on Earth. But that doesn't invalidate the theory of evolution, or the common ancestry for the organisms in which it is well supported, which is currently all of them. So that's the second meaning of evolution. That's not the one we're talking about. We're not talking about that one either. The third meaning of evolution is that all life goes back to a single common ancestor. There was a first living thing, and everything branched out from that first living thing. That didn't have to be at all. Yep, and maybe it did, and the other nine just didn't leave descendants. Whatever it is that caused the existence of the first living thing might have spontaneously caused the existence of ten living things. Yep, but arguing that evolution could have been different doesn't really argue that it didn't happen. My mom's mom could have had another kid after her last one. That'd give me an extra aunt or uncle. She didn't, but that doesn't mean she's not my grandmother. A hundred living things, and each one could have given rise to a line of descent. Not in principle, that's just how the evidence has shaken out. It's kind of like how geography is really dedicated to the equatorial circumference of the Earth being 40,075 kilometers. It's not that it had to have been that, and that some other value would have been a disaster for the globe Earth. It's just that, after checking, that's what it turned out to be. And if you want to overturn it, you'll need some damn good evidence. But no, the theory of evolution is committed to the idea that there's a single thing. Then there's a certain description of how new species arise. You have groups of items, and they're bunched in classes, and the classes are isolated from one another. What was the name of Darwin's famous book? The Origin of Species. Origin of Species. He thought that was the key problem, to describe where species come from. I don't know about the key problem, but it certainly was a problem he was interested in, and hence he gathered data and made a hypothesis about it. Turns out he was basically right, although in some details he was wrong, and there's a lot more to it than he knew about. And there's a certain way of describing how the changes give rise to new species. It's a fourth meaning of evolution. None of these is what we're talking about. Really? You could have fooled me, because between common ancestry and the mechanisms of evolution, I'm not sure what else we really could be talking about. None of these is what we are talking about. One second. The fifth meaning, the one we are talking about, is this. What is the cause of the changes? What makes the changes happen? What's the explanation of the changes? Mutation, selection, and drift, all of which are already observed in labs, in the wild, and in simulations. The theory of evolution says the, or the major, the most important, the primary cause of the changes is random variations, which then are subject to selection. The random variations have effect on how the changed organism survives. And these have to be heritable, that is to say they have to be inherited from, from uh, organism to organism. And that's what does it. Yeah, there's some debate about other contributing factors, but the major factor that does the job is random variations plus selection. Actually, I would argue that in the long run, drift is more important than selection in terms of the actual genomic content of populations, but selection is also very important for allowing such populations to persist. That's what we're talking about. When we talk about probability, it's that description of evolution that we're talking about. But probably only applies to the mutation side of that, because selection is decidedly non-random. We can't just ignore the non-random processes. We're back to my reaction diffusion simulation. The initial setup where the two chemicals, or in my case, numbers, are random, but what happens to them over the course of the simulation is not. 
Given the same seed of numbers and the same grid to propagate across, you'll get the same simulation each time. You see the envelope of life. You say that there were changes and gradual changes. All that you could conceivably verify from the fossil record. Which we have. Without an explanation, without a cause, without an engine, without knowing what makes it happen that way. That's a separate discipline, a separate study. Yes, in fact, this idea is faunal succession, and it was well known before Darwin ever published his book. It was often explained by progressive creation before there was a well-understood mechanism for evolution. But coupled with the fact that we can watch in real time mutation and selection occur in a lab, like in the long-term Lenski experiment, and in the wild, like in Darwin's finches, that means it's a solid explanation for the evidence of the same change in the past. What we're talking about is the engine that makes it happen. Now, the reason that's important is because the engine that makes it happen is founded on random variation. Selection only preserves the ones that are successful and eliminates the ones that are not successful. You can't create anything with selection. You can only cut out the unsuccessful ones with selection. Right. This is no surprise. It is well acknowledged by everyone in the field of evolutionary biology. Selection does not produce novel genetic sequences or novel traits. This is done by mutation. Selection simply then acts to eliminate or preserve and spread around these sequences and traits. Behind selection is something that's generating new, new types, new features. That's where it's an unguided, unmanaged, unfocused. I know the word random is tricky. The word random has all sorts of technical meanings. No one has a good meaning for the word random. Too bad. It's another problem. But it's accidental, unguided, unfocused, no intelligence behind it then I want a probability. That's no different from the gun spinning on a pivot or an uh, or, uh, uh, object landing on the X three times. It's something which is supposed to happen by accident. Well, I want a probability for that. For what? The existence of mutations? It's 100%. For the probability of any given mutation? Well, that's a function of the kind of mutation and its locus, but it is in principle calculable. For the chance that a particular population would produce any mutation that resulted in a positive or negative selection, well, we'd need to know how much of the sequence space could result in such selection, which means that our estimates would always be low, but that's also calculable. But I still don't know what specifically he wants a probability for. It's like me asking him for what the probability of Judaism is. I mean, it's 100% probable that Jews exist, because I can go look at some of them, talk to them, etc., what are the probabilities that Judaism would develop as it did after the destruction of the Second Temple? I mean, probably low, but not zero. The probability that the stories contained in the Tanakh are historically true? Well, that's going to vary from essentially zero for some to nearly 100% for others. See what I mean? You can't just ask for the probability of some big thing and then get back a meaningful answer. He needs to be much more specific. The chances for a given mutation occurring are very low. The chances for mutations occurring at all is 100% if the population is still reproducing. The chance for selectable mutations is experimentally shown to be very high because it's trivial to induce natural selection in laboratory populations and then to show that selection has in fact altered the frequency of certain traits in that population. And if you don't give me a probability, there isn't enough reason to accept that it's true. Period. If you don't answer my malformed question, I'm going to reject science is certainly a take. I don't think it's a good one, but it is one of the takes of all time. Questions up to here. Now, I've challenged people with this. I've told them, write to your biology professors, write to your philosophy professors, you know, get me an answer to this. I know there isn't an answer because Thomas Nagel put it in a book which caused howls and shrieks of protest, but nobody answered it. When someone asks a question that is not even comprehensible, it's not surprising that no one answers that question. For example, if I ask, how is yellow, there isn't much of an answer to be given. If I ask, what is the probability of electrons, that similarly has no answer. The probability that evolution occurs is simply one. The probability of things within that is going to vary. Nobody even tried to answer. Nobody said, oh, you say there's no probability? Here it is, A, B, and C. Nobody even tried to do that. How is the protest at all coming? Nobody answered that, that, that point. Well, if it's the same point that David is trying to make, then I expect the howls or protests were basically the same with mine. You can't answer a question that doesn't make any sense. If you want to know what the volume of Earth's gravity is, there isn't a meaningful answer to be given. If you want to know how many pints make up a mile, that similarly has no meaningful answer. And as I say, it's not a, it's not a new point. It's been going on for, for, for decades. I think that's conclusive. The only thing I can conclude from this is that this guy has absolutely no idea what evolution is, 
how statistics works, or how science works. Which wouldn't normally be a problem, except that he made a video in which he attempts to spread anti-science belief, and that's not okay. Try it out. You have, I'm sure you know true believers, I'm sure you know people who, you know, live, live, live and die for evolution. Ask them that question. Please don't. Please ask a question that makes sense. I've been talking about this like this way for 20 years. No one has even offered, offered an answer to the question. He could have been talking about this this way for 200 years. If you ask a question that doesn't mean anything, you're not going to get an answer. Let me ask you, how long is a kilogram? When are letters? Where is acceleration? I think that's right. Are we together so far? Nope. I'm lost. Okay. Now, there's something else um, called vestigial organs. That's a Matt Powell-level topic change, but okay. Vestigial organs are features of the body that either don't do any job at all, or they do the jobs badly. Vestigial usually refers to things that don't do any job. Are they badly designed? No, that is a bad definition. It might work fine for babies, but adults who want to actually meaningfully discuss evolution need to do better. Vestigial organs are those that no longer function effectively for the primary use which homologous organs in ancestral and related populations have the organ. So, for example, an ostrich wing is vestigial because in other birds, including the ancestors of the ostrich, the wings are primarily organs of flight, but ostriches don't use them for that, being flightless. That doesn't mean that they're useless. They help the animal communicate and keep balance. And here there are two failures, a philosophical failure and a factual failure. Uh, let's see how it's supposed to go. Let's say there are features of the body that serve no purpose, which would be an indication of bad design. A good designer doesn't put in things that don't have any purpose. Or features that are badly designed, that don't do their job in the best way that they could. We could easily think of designs that would do it better. Neither of these things would indicate vestigiality on their own. For example, cats with polydactyly generally get no real use out of their supernumerary claws, but those claws aren't vestigial because there was no polydactyl cat ancestor with use for those claws. Let's say that's true. So what? What has that got to do with evolution? What's it got to do with... What's it got to do with evolution? See, the thing is, I can't tell if he's asking what do useless organs have to do with evolution, or what do vestigial organs have to do with evolution? I guess I'll try to answer both. Useless organs generally do not persist in a population because they cost energy to make, can become injured, increase mortality, and there is no selection pressure to keep them. As a result, if we could see the persistence of completely useless organs in many organisms that are not vestigial, that would be evidence against evolution. We generally don't see this, at least in the wild. Domesticated animals, like those cats with too many fingers, are generally shielded from some of the harms that they might otherwise suffer from various genetic problems. What vestigial organs have to do with evolution is that they are explained and predicted by evolution. But other options, such as special creation, do not predict them, and can really only accommodate them by having a designer that wants to design things to make it look like evolution occurred, since in known instances of intelligent design, such things generally would not be included. Like, if you're designing a car for northern Greenland, you probably don't put in an air conditioner, but like, seal the vents to it or something, so it can't function as an air conditioner. Even if the added weight gives you better traction or something. Now, you can argue that Hashem, since this guy is Jewish, just doesn't design like humans do. Okay, but if we're going to accept that he can design deceptively and poorly, it becomes essentially impossible for the evidence to indicate design in the first place, simply on the basis of the actual traits of organisms. Instead, to indicate design, you would have to disconfirm every single non-design possibility, even the ones no one has thought of. Good luck with that. So the, pro the proposal here is double. Number one, it supports evolution. And number two, it rules out an explanation in terms of a creator. I wouldn't actually say that it rules out the possibility of a creator, just that it indicates against design by any non-deceptive creator. It rules out the explanation in terms of the creator because creator, we assume, could do better than that. The creator could make excellent design or perfect design. And if it's clear that the design is bad, then it's not going to be a creator who did it. Well, not one with the qualities normally ascribed to the creator in Abrahamic religions like Judaism or Islam. Although others like Mandaism might more easily accommodate a creator who just kind of sucks at creating and also wants to trick everyone. Because in that mythology, the world wasn't actually created by the object of worship of Mandaism but rather by the combination of an angelic figure, Tahil, and the queen of the underworld, the evil Ruha. 
Then again, Jews don't have to believe in any gods, although it's hard to see why an atheist Jew would want to argue in favor of a creator over and against evolution. That seems like the purview of the theistic types. Of course, just from looking at David Gottlieb, I feel like he'd be the one to say that atheist Jews don't count as Jews, but hopefully I'm wrong. Whereas on the other hand, evolution can explain it. Because how is evolution supposed to work? You got a thing that's wallowing around, waddling around, you know, trying to get food out and reproduce and run away from its predators and adapt and... Way to poison the well by describing the very existence of life forms as silly. Hmm. Maybe that's not the best metaphor for this video. Um, well, I only mean it metaphorically, and I don't know what other metaphor to use. Sorry about that. Fun fact, most of the times that Jews in medieval Europe were accused of poisoning wells, it was in fact because of diseases that weren't even waterborne in the first place. So that's a thing. And even in cases where it was a waterborne disease, it's not like the people who hadn't figured out sewers needed outside help to spread that kind of disease. It's always been easy to blame those you see as others when an otherwise inexplicable evil befalls you. But that doesn't make it right. And there are other things running around, competing for food, and the things that want to eat it, and things it wants to eat, and it's just, you know, doing its best in its circumstances. If it succeeds, that means it succeeds on the whole. I don't know what that means. The fact that it succeeds doesn't mean that it's perfectly designed. It just means that on the whole, with its good design features and bad design features, on the whole, it's good enough to keep going. Yeah, that's true. Natural selection selects those organisms that are good enough. Rarely do individuals actually reach the peak of fitness possible in their environment. Even when they do, it means that simply because any variation away from their traits will of necessity be less fit, and because their offspring are guaranteed to at least have some traits that are different, that the organism's descendants will, on the whole, move away from that fitness peak anyway. Now, I suppose you have a mutation, and that changes it a little bit. Makes it a little bit better. So then it'll be better. And then it'll be better than the old ones, and outcompete the old ones, and do better in the environment. No one thought that it's perfect. Correct. That an organism is better than its peers in terms of evolutionary fitness doesn't indicate that it has perfect fitness by which I assume we mean the highest fitness possible in the current environment. Furthermore, when you make a little step to get better, that little step to get better has to be good for the thing you're working with. And the thing you're working with might not tolerate steps to get better that don't help it, because it's carrying along all the stuff that it has so far. Um, I'm not really sure what's being said here, which seems to be a theme with this guy. He just says words that don't really seem to correlate to anything in evolutionary biology. If a new trait is beneficial, then it's beneficial. What other stuff can't tolerate this trait? Other traits? Then the new trait isn't beneficial. This is the problem with trying to discuss evolution or other technical fields with people who don't have the first clue. Eyes. Are eyes useful? In many environments, yes. In others, like a deep cave, often not. Sure, but not under your armpit. Yeah, probably why most organisms have eyes on their head, or at least the end of tentacles, and not under armpits. But I'm not sure what the point is. That's not going to be very useful. Because if you have to see things, you're going to walk around like this. <laughs> the saber tooth eye is going to get you for sure. <laughs> right. Not everything, not everything helps. A thing helps because it grafts onto where you are. You are necessarily carrying along with you everything you've got. When you make a change, it's in addition to everything you've got. Yeah, it's well understood that evolution is constrained by the current morphology of organisms. Bats aren't going to suddenly grow spinnerets, even if it might be handy for them to have spider webs of their own. All evolutionary change is a modification of what came before, and on the ground, in real time, it always looks fairly minor. It takes deep time to make things look like real novelties. But even then, if you could watch it all happen, you realize that like the author of Ecclesiastes says, there is nothing new under the sun. Now... Let's imagine, here's an example that they actually use. There are animals that are underground, which have eyes, but are blind. Because the answer, the suggestion is, they're living underground. They're living underground where there's no light. Where there's no light, there's no use for, for, uh, for, uh, for, for sight. Beyond that eyes are easily injured, and so are a risk to any animal with them, but if that risk is outweighed by the usefulness of being able to see, they'll persist. But for, say, a mole, since there is a risk to the eyes and basically no benefit, they tend to go away through evolution. And during intermediate periods, they will be small and degenerate, perhaps even completely covered by skin so they're not exposed to injury. 
So keeping all the neural machinery that underlies sight is pointless. You can put it to better use with smell or with digging or something else. The eyes? The eyes are carried along. They had eyes before. So the evolution hasn't devised a way. Carrying the eyes isn't too expensive if the brain is disconnected from that. It's just a, just a piece of fold of flesh, that's all. I thought he was supposed to be arguing against evolution, not explaining why vestigial organs with little to no use may persist. I guess I should thank him for helping me do my job. Okay, deep, deep sea, deep sea um, fish, same way. So you carry along the eyes. Vestigial organs are things that once were useful, but then you change your style of life. They're no longer useful because your style of life doesn't need them anymore. And evolution just hasn't gotten around to cleaning them up and eliminating them. That's what evolution predicts. When you find vestigial organs, that's evidence for evolution. And it's also evidence against the main competing hypothesis, which is, hypothesis, hypothesis, which is that God did it. Well, it's certainly not evidence against theistic evolution, which involves a god, but since no one predicted the existence of vestigial organs on the basis of intelligent design that I can find, it's certainly not bolstering that idea. And given that God is generally thought of as super smart and benevolent, I argue that special creation should predict that we would not find vestigial organs. But of course, once you have an omnipotent actor, you can accommodate any data, which means that the idea is unfalsifiable, which also means it has no place in science. Both ends of this story are wrong. First of all, enormous um, progress has been made in the last 20 years in discovering uses for vestigial organs. Okay, but again, vestigial doesn't require that an organ not have any use, just that it not have the typical use for such an organ. And the fact that what used to be thought were poorly designed, um, poorly designed, um, Organs or features of the body are really not poorly designed at all, but optimally designed. Tell just about any human over the age of 35 that their spine was optimally designed for bipedalism and then let them glare at you in back pain. Um, the appendix plays a role in the immune system. So do the adenoids. Yep, but that doesn't make them vestigial or not. The question is, what do they do in other organisms who inherited them from the same ancestor as the one that gave the population with a potentially vestigial organ theirs? Is it what they do in the organism in question? Um, the eye, even Dawkins wrote that the eye proves the designer is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is incompetent because you have the retina and then you have the optic nerve that goes up to the brain. And the retina comes from inside, I'm sorry, the optic nerve comes from inside the retina. By inside, I mean closer to the surface of the face and goes through the retina through a hole, and then goes up to, the, up to the brain. And that means that there's a little hole in the center of the retina, and at that point you can't see, because you haven't got any retinal cells to be sensitive to the light. And that's what's called a blind spot. You have a blind spot, one in each eye, where the, where the optic nerve goes back to the retina. So, until very recently, the attitude was, what a kludge! Anybody would understand that you got to put the, the optic nerve behind the retina, not in front of the retina to go back through. It's ridiculous. And there are creatures that have it that way. The eye is very, very popular in evolution. The, according to Ernst Meyer, the eye evolved independently at least 40 times. I don't know about the number 40, but it certainly evolved independently many times. But I'm waiting for why the optic nerve going through the retina is a good idea. Independently. It's a very popular thing. Uh, convergent evolution like that is something that one has to be, talk about, but I don't, I don't have time for it tonight. At any rate, it turns out, contrary to uh, what they used to think, about five years ago, some studies were done, having the optic nerve outside and going through a hole in the center is optimal. Hard to see why, but let's see what he's got for us. Also, I'd love it if he actually cited this study, but alas, we just have to take his word for it, which um, I won't do. It's not a detracting factor, it's optimal. Because there are certain cells that are necessary to keep stability of the, of the retina, and they are connected to the optic nerve, and all of them are supported by the optic nerve going back through from the, from the outside, and that makes it optimal. No, it doesn't, because as has already been stated, there are other options for the eye that also work, and which don't have this lack of needed stability. The fact that the tetrapod eye is stabilized by the optic nerve 
that comes from in front of the retina doesn't mean that that's how eyes have to be stabilized or are best stabilized. Squid have eyes that are stable, and yet their optic nerves come from behind the retina. Furthermore, the blind spot. When's the last time you noticed your blind spot? Almost never, because while it's suboptimal, it's good enough. You know, that thing we've already agreed is what evolution is looking for. If I can be forgiven for anthropomorphizing evolution. When's the last time you missed the bus because your blind spot got in the way and you couldn't see the number? Never, because buses are designed to be noticed by humans, and so they tend not to fit right into the blind spot visually. But I'm sure I've failed to notice a bug or two because of my blind spot. Perhaps even a mosquito I'd rather have crushed than let drink my vital fluids. You're not even conscious of the blind spot. Until you told about it, you never notice it. That's still irrelevant to whether it's an ideal design or a poor design. No one ever got eaten by a saber-toothed tiger because the tiger disappeared in the blind spot and you couldn't see it, and therefore you're... It's, it's tiny. It's tiny. And the brain fills in the background to cover the spot so you're not conscious of it. Work the brain wouldn't need to do if the blind spot were simply not there, which it doesn't need to be. So the whole story was wrong. Not based on what we just heard, but also, why is this guy so upset about this? It's just people differing on the origin of biodiversity. It's really not something to get heated about. I want to give you a, a little bit more detailed example of the same story where it's, where it's, uh, where it's wrong. And this is just, um, it's beyond belief. I guess I won't believe it then. What does DNA do? Depends on the bit of DNA. Some codes for protein, some regulates gene expression, some is just a mechanical barrier to damage of other parts of the genome. Some of it spaces out genes so that they aren't all transcribed at once. Some is intergenic and can change the final product of the gene by splitting it up into smaller bits. Some of it does basically nothing useful, which is actually most of it. Until about 15 years ago, the consensus was DNA codes for the production of proteins. That consensus hasn't changed. It does. It's just that not all of it does. The DNA sits there. RNA sidles up and attaches itself to a section of the DNA. Nice use of sidle, but not quite. The RNA is built up to correspond to the DNA being transcribed. The RNA isn't just floating around. The constituents of it are, and they arrange themselves into an RNA strand as transcription goes. See what I mean about this guy not actually knowing what he's talking about? Copies its structure, then it detaches, and it goes over to a ribosome, and there it creates a protein. Other than the mistake I already corrected, yes, that is how RNA works. In absurdly simplified terms that ignore things like the difference between transfer RNA and messenger RNA. The DNA is instructions for creating proteins. No, some of it is. Most of it isn't. Okay. How much of the DNA programs for proteins? 4%. The number I got when I looked into this was 1.15%. Not 4%, but okay. 96% does not code for proteins. Hmm. What's the 96% doing? I already explained what. Some of it is just to protect the genome. Some of it is regulatory. Some of it is literally doing nothing but existing. Answer! It's vestigial. It's doing nothing. It was called junk DNA. I guess I can think of some of it as vestigial, although that term usually applies to organs, not genes. But also, no one thinks that the dichotomy is protein coding versus literally nothing. That was its total, that was its official title in evolutionary biology. Junk DNA. What a spectacular example of God not doing it. 96% is junk, only 4%. But evolution predicts this. Well, it predicts that some DNA will be useless, but not exactly how much in a given organism. That, 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 that DNA comes from some primitive animal ancestor, which came from a squid, which came from a clam, which came from a, from a, from a colony of bacteria. There are no squids or clams in the ancestry of non-mollusks. The DNA is pulled along and pulled along, tweaked here and tweaked there to improve itself, and all the old stuff is just carried along, to the point where 96% of it is just dead weight, doing nothing. About 15 years ago, this started to come apart because people started to find functions for the so-called junk DNA. A paper came out in Nature, this is only about three years ago, a paper in Nature with 350 authors. Put in the comments your prediction as to whether Rabbi Dr. David Gottlieb will actually give the name of the paper. Science papers sometimes have a lot of authors, but this is a worldwide effort. Charting chemical activity of the DNA. So far, they have found that 80% of the DNA is chemically active. 
Ah, so I do know what paper this is. It's the preliminary report from the ENCODE project from 2012, titled An Integrated Encyclopedia of DNA Elements in the Human Genome, and the listed authors are basically just everyone who worked at ENCODE. Now, ENCODE's mission is to make a full map of the entire human genome, including what every bit of it does, whether that's useful or not. Also, I should point out that the 2012 paper claimed about 80.4% of the DNA displayed chemical activity, meaning that 196 did not. So even that report wasn't saying there was no non-functional DNA under their overly broad definition. And of course, only a couple years later, they walked back their functionality claim considerably, and now it's in line with previous estimates of functionality based on things like knockout tests in rodents, where big sections of the genome are simply removed, and the mice are functionally indistinguishable from other mice with intact genomes, and in fact go on to reproduce with other mice normally. If it's chemically active, then the assumption is that it makes a difference in what goes on in the cell, in which case evolution can apply to it, selection can apply to it, and then the idea that it's functionless becomes very, very hard to swallow. That isn't entirely wrong. Much of the chemical activity in a cell is spurious, simply because chemistry is going to chemistry, whether it's for the good of the cell or not. This means that things like spurious transcriptions will always occur, no matter how much the cell does or doesn't need it. This means random bits of the genome will be transcribed to RNA that then just doesn't do anything and eventually breaks down. The 2012 ENCODE paper would call that function. Similarly, if part of the genome is methylated, that makes that part of the genome nearly impossible to turn into RNA, rendering it quite functionless. And yet methylation is biochemical activity, and so the 2012 ENCODE paper counted it as function. Basically, the definition of function used by ENCODE was that if X does Y, then Y is the function of X. So to bring it outside the realm of DNA, if a hot pan burns your hand, then the function of hot pans is to burn your hands. Of course, we know that that's not true. That's not why humans heat up pans. They do it to prepare food. That's the function. The burning of hands is an unwanted and often avoided side effect. Or there might be something with no practical use. Perhaps your grandmother left you her porcelain dolls, and you just kind of forgot about them in a display cabinet in the guest room. Now they collect dust. So the function of your grandmother's porcelain dolls is to collect dust. Well, no, they don't really have a function. And the fact that they're collecting dust is actually evidence of that. Just like methylation in DNA is evidence of lack of function. And of course, just remember that David here isn't mentioning that ENCODE corrected this paper only a couple years later, and that the findings made a splash not because of how amazing they were, but because of how obviously wrong they were. Something ENCODE now agrees with. But they have found specific cases of non-coding DNA, and they know what the function is. Yes, one of the biggest functions of non-coding DNA is to serve as a promoter for coding DNA so that the DNA is expressed. This isn't news and doesn't negate the fact that the majority of the human genome doesn't just not have a known function, but instead is known to be functionless. Here's the one that I find spectacular. 96% doesn't code. Take the 4% that does. Little stretches which the RNA copies and then makes proteins out of. But guess what? In the stretch that does code, there are little pieces that don't code either, called interons. Well, it's intron, not interon, but yes, this is true, and it's characteristic of eukaryotic genomes. Prokaryotes don't have introns. Now, the ends of introns on either side are functional in that they inform the machinery of the cell to cut out the intron. But in the stretch between these cut here markers, the DNA is just a mess of random mutations and transposons, which are basically useless genetic parasites, also repeats, etc. They are very clearly not functional stretches of DNA, and the fact that they are transcribed only to be cut out indicates this rather well. They just junk in the way. So here's what happens. The RNA copies it, including the little pieces that don't code. Then the RNA splits up into pieces. The little pieces that don't code drop out. The other pieces sew back together, and that sewed back together goes over to the ribosome, ribosome and creates the protein. I'm impressed. Compared to the rest of this, I can tell that David has actually bothered to learn about how eukaryotic transcription and protein synthesis works, at least in some detail. If only he could have this level of familiarity with the rest of what he's saying. What a kludge! What a Rube Goldberg pr uh, procedure! You got the thing that codes with things that don't code, copy it all, detach, fold out the ones that don't code, then retach it together. What a stupid, inefficient system. In fact, yes, it is pretty inefficient, and we can tell because the organisms that don't do this, such as bacteria, are measurably more efficient when it comes to protein synthesis. There's a reason that when an organism was chosen to be genetically engineered to produce human insulin for use in type 1 diabetics, 
it was a bacterium and not an animal, plant, or fungus. Guess what they discovered? Yeah, the little pieces that drop out don't code. But the rest of the pieces that do code, they just sew together to make the instructions for making the protein. You can sew them together in more than one way. Which still requires more energy than just having separate genes for the separate proteins that lack introns, and still doesn't make anything but the end bits of the introns functional. Introns could be much smaller and lack things like transposons and stretches of noise and still perform this function, which again is still less efficient than it could be. That introns as such have some function doesn't mean that all DNA in an intron is functional. You can sew them together in 20 different ways and make 20 different proteins. That means the single section of the DNA is coding for 20 proteins. Not one, but 20. That multiplies the informational content of the DNA by 20. Oh, hey, an anti-evolutionist with a definition of information. I guess information is how many proteins you can make with a particular stretch of DNA. Kind of a weird definition, as I'd expect that proteins of different sizes to be different amounts of information. But I guess not. Let's just hope he sticks with this definition of information. The functional uh, information content. And guess what? The little pieces that drop out sew the other ones back together. Kind of, but again, the middle bit of introns is just noise. So at best, you can say that there is function at the head and tail of the intron, but not all of it. They determine the orders in which the other ones can be sewed together. Are they useless? Are they junk? No, they are not. They actually multiply the coding capacity of the DNA by 20. Yes, as a whole, introns are not junk, but they contain junk because most of a given intron is going to be functionless because the length and sequence of introns is essentially unconstrained, except for the small functional bits at the end. So they don't code. So what? That doesn't make them useless, functionless, junk. Correct. Non-coding is not synonymous with non-functional, but neither does that mean that all non-coding DNA has function. One of the ways we can tell if DNA has function is whether it is under selection pressure. If DNA is functionless, then it doesn't really matter what the sequence of that DNA is, or exactly how long that DNA is. Whereas if it has function, then those things do matter, and we can check the genomes of organisms, humans included, to see which parts of the DNA are so constrained, because such regions of the genome will be highly conserved, not just within species, but even between them. We also observe that most of the human genome shows no evidence of being conserved by selection, meaning that it doesn't matter to the functioning of humans what's in that DNA, meaning that DNA is functionless since it can be literally anything or nothing with no effect on the organism. That's why I can say with confidence that much of the human genome is said to be functionless, not simply because we don't know of a function for it, but because we know it not to have a function. This isn't just default to no function until we can show otherwise. This is we can show no function positively. Another thing, these complicated molecules, like proteins, and certainly like DNA, you've seen the beautiful graphic... uh, uh, accounts of the double helix of the, of the DNA. But of course, DNA never exists as a super long chain, yards long, of a double helix. It's all bundled up together, wound up about on itself over and over again. I think he just means that DNA exists in chromosomes, which for eukaryotes is true. Proteins are that way too. They're all wound up on themselves. How do they wind up? Chemistry. Different amino acids have different electrochemical properties, meaning that they attract or repel other amino acids in a protein, causing the whole thing to fold in on itself. Now, sometimes shepherd proteins are used to reduce the energy needed for these folds, and the folds are so complex that we do not currently have a working mathematical model that can successfully predict how a protein will fold just from the amino acid sequence. But we do know that the answer is chemistry, not magic. What makes them wind up? Does it matter how they wind up? Yes, the way a protein folds exposes various functional sections of the protein to the intra- or extracellular environment so that it can perform its function. Misfolded proteins have functional sites that are inactivated and may form spurious functional sites that may even be harmful, turning the protein into a toxin. It matters a lot. If it winds up the right way, then it does all the things it has to do. If it winds up another way, it won't do those things. It might even do harmful things. That's why protein coding regions tend to be highly constrained and show lots of evidence of selection as do associated non-coding regions such as promoters. Sometimes it'll do nothing, and sometimes it'll do destruction. It's got to wind up the right way. What winds it up? There are no spools in there winding it up. No. The molecules that make up the DNA have magnetic forces. 
Um, no. In order for the DNA, which doesn't have any significant magnetic force, to be the cause of protein folding, the DNA would have to be present where the folding occurs. But in eukaryotes, the folding occurs outside the ribosome, which itself is outside the nucleus, which is where the DNA is. The DNA isn't there to fold the proteins. I can't believe I just said that this guy seemed to have looked into this and have a pretty decent understanding, only for him to then go on and say that proteins fold because of magnetic DNA. And they stick to one another in a particular way. It's an unsolved problem. How something that's thousands of links long folds up in a fraction of a second the right way every time. No one knows how that happens. Actually, it doesn't happen every time, and we do know how it happens. It's chemistry. Positive charges and negative charges attract, and boom. It happens for the same reason that water molecules attract each other's positive end to negative end. The mechanism is well understood. What's lacking is a way to predict in the highly complex environment of a protein chain exactly what folds will occur. That's the unsolved problem. No one is wondering what forces are at play. It's similar to the three-body problem in physics. Everyone knows how orbits are established. Gravity. But in gravitational systems with more than two bodies, the interplay of forces is extremely complex, and so there is no single equation that can simulate n-body gravitational systems continuously. Instead, the only way we've found to simulate gravity with more than two bodies is to simply sum the forces at a certain point, then move the objects in the simulation a distance by skipping forward in time, then resumming the forces. This is accurate enough if the time steps are short, but it's never completely accurate. But that doesn't mean that maybe orbits are actually not the result of gravity. Similarly, we know how proteins fold. We just can't predict it exactly. But that's how it happens. But what holds it together is the magnetic properties of the molecules. So a lot of the molecules are in there to make sure that it folds the right way. Well, electromagnetic and the molecules are the ones in the protein, not the ones in the DNA. But then, yes. And the thing is that this is selectable because, as David has already pointed out, improper folding in a protein means that it will no longer function as it did originally, meaning misfolded proteins can be selected against. No one has to understand protein folding for natural selection to work on it. That's one of the great things about natural selection. It works whether it's understood or not. You might say that it works in mysterious ways. They don't code for protein, but so what? What's the they here? The proteins? They do not code for protein. Or are we back to thinking that DNA has magnetic forces that fold proteins, which again, it categorically does not. It's got to fold the right way, otherwise it won't do anything. Any molecule that's there to make sure it folds up the right way is functional. It's not junk. Yes, and literally none of these molecules exist in the DNA because all of the molecules that assist in protein folding are themselves proteins that exist outside of the nucleus. And so it goes. Every week there's another discovery as to what the DNA, uh, what the pieces of the DNA are doing. So from the idea that 96% is junk, now that idea is on the run. Most have said we shouldn't talk about junk DNA anymore. It's just a mistake. The whole thing's a mistake. And it's an open field. What the... Uh, what the, what the DNA does. Uh, no, that's completely wrong, and even in code says it's wrong. And further, I'm not sure where he got the idea about 4% of the genome is coding. It's less than 2%. Now I'm going to tell you a footnote. Many people have heard of this. It was very, very widely publicized, that human beings and, and um, chimpanzees share 98.6% of their DNA. Are we about to get a Tompkins reference here? Gee, I hope not. I picked this guy in an effort to see what non-Christian anti-evolutionism was up to? Apparently, the answer is parasitizing Christian anti-evolution. So that's great. So that was a cause célèbre. He should work on his French. And I will take just a moment to explain the philosophical problem here. Well, look, the difference between us and, chimp and chimpanzees is 1.4% of the DNA. In alignable regions, which is important because they're alignable primarily because they are constrained, which means these are the regions that are likely functional. There's no simple way to just get a single number for the whole genomes of chimps and humans, in part because the genomes aren't even the same size. That's why DNA comparisons always come with an explanation of what's actually being compared. At least they do in the actual literature. What filters down to the news outlets and then to people like Gottlieb often loses that nuance. Maybe the nuance is unwelcome. Now listen, that's science. That's a number. 1.6 is precise. It seems to me that human beings and, and, and chimpanzees are very, very different, but I have to be wrong. That's just an impression. They are very different in some ways and very similar in others. Biochemically, they're almost identical, to the point that vets treating captive chimps can use human blood for transfusions. 
DNA similarity on its own won't tell you much about the morphological or behavioral similarities between two organisms. Although it'll tell you something about it, it turns out that relatively small mutations in certain developmental or regulatory regions of the DNA can have significant morphological, cognitive, and behavioral effects on an organism. That's just a feeling. 1.6 is a number. It's a precise number. So that has to be right. So my feeling that we're so different is wrong. We're really very, very much the same. 98.6% the same. Because the scientific picture is a number, and a number is precise. Well, first of all, the conclusion is stupid. Oh, it's stupid. Are scientists meant to be poopy heads? Do we need a timeout to calm down? Maybe some milk in a box? Maybe what you should have thought is, obviously we're very, very different with chimpanzees, so, surprise, surprise, 1.6% difference of DNA can make very big differences. Which is what everyone in the field thinks. He's not coming up with something the researchers haven't here. Don't use the little number 1.6 to prove that the differences aren't big. Okay, that's not being done, so problem solved. Can't you tell the difference between a manned mission to the moon? And do you see a stick to get ants out of an anthill? I mean, you don't see a difference there? A difference of quite, you know, a difference of orders of magnitude? Yes, everyone notices the huge difference in degree in tool use between members of genus Pan and humans. No one is denying this. So they use a tool. They make a tool by stripping off the side branches and put it in the ants, come out and they eat them. Hey, termites too. And we put men on the moon. That's a 1.6% difference? Come on, be realistic. You know, I mean, be serious, 1.4% difference. I wonder how much raising of his voice and incredulity David thinks it takes before it shows that science is wrong. You'll note that so far, he has not at any point actually disputed the number of 98.6% similarity in allylo regions of the DNA between chimps and humans. I wonder why that is. I was expecting him to use Jeffrey Tompkins' works, but so far, no. I guess that's good, but at least Tompkins tried to address the actual number rather than just rant about the moon. So you should have said, a very little difference in the genes can make a gigantic difference in the output. That is what scientists are saying. I guess David just isn't listening. Which isn't surprising, given how little knowledge of biology he has evinced in this talk. Okay, but guess what, boys and girls? When they said that our DNA and their DNA is 98.6% the same, they only meant the 4% that codes for proteins. Uh, no. <laughs> In fact, it is any alignable region, which includes many non-coding regions. This is just wrong, because again, David doesn't understand what he's talking about, making his attempts at critique mostly incoherent. Because only the 4% of the codes for proteins is really doing anything, and all the rest is junk, so they didn't take account of the junk. Nope, so let's go into how these comparisons are actually done. Whole genome sequences, or chromosome sequences, are generally put into a computer program for a target genome and a query genome. For instance, I might load in a human genome as my target genome, and a chimpanzee genome as my query genome. Parameters are then input into the computer program for things like how it is to treat gaps, and how long the sequences are that it will look to align. It then simply looks across the whole of the two genomes that are input to find alignable regions between the two of them. The program neither knows nor cares if the regions it aligns are coding or not, and they may even be coding in one organism and not in the other. It then compares the regions it can align and spits out a percent alignment for each segment it could align. In order to restrict the comparison to only coding regions, one would have to only input coding regions. But this is not standard practice, and it would not be reported as a DNA similarity in alignable regions, but a DNA similarity for coding regions, which is not what the 98.6% is. So this is a mistake based on a mistake. The only mistake here is a man who knows essentially nothing about a technical field, pretending that he does on the grounds seemingly that he thinks of himself as a big brain, and that he doesn't like that particular field of science. Pro tip, if you think that you, who know nothing about a technical field, have thought of something obvious that all the people in the field have just been ignoring? Chances are, you're wrong. They do know about it, and they have already accounted for it. Now that you know that the DNA is, much of it, much of it has now been proven to be functional, 80% is chemically active. Which, remember, is not an indication of function. So you ought to measure the comparison between human and chimpanzee DNA across the board, and then the overlap is about 70%. Now, not 98.6%.
And there's Tompkins' number. Glad we got there eventually. And the fun thing is that the 70% number is one even Tompkins doesn't stand by, because he's been forced to admit that the computer program he used to get that number was bugged, and that the number it gave him is useless. Now, he's had two other numbers, both in the 80s, for human-chimp similarity. In the first case, he set his program, called Blast, to use the ungapped parameter, which is simply not how this works. To explain how it works, suppose that you and I both transcribed Edgar Allan Poe's poem, The Raven. Now, in the ninth stanza, which is about the halfway point, the first line is, Much I marveled at this ungainly fowl to hear its discourse so plainly. And let's say that I leave out the H in much, but you, diligent copyist that you are, manage the whole poem correctly. Now, to my credit, that's the only mistake I made, but it leaves a gap between our transcriptions. The ungap parameter would not recognize this as a single change, and instead would rate our transcriptions as only about 50% similar, assuming it even managed to align them in the first place. Clearly, this is not appropriate, and this method was later tested with control organisms by Gutsa Gibbon. She found that it always returned similarity values in the 80s with any organism she tried, including using the same genome as both the query and the target genome, meaning that it should return a percent identity of 100%. Tompkins' later method was simply to do the math wrong, and by that I mean in a way that your average 14-year-old can identify as wrong. Which is why I call him the creationist who can't math. Assuming I don't suck at this, I put a card linking to Erica's video in which she peer reviews Tompkins to show what an absolute doofus he is up in the upper right. It's a 30% difference. That can account for a lot. Yes, it can. It's just not an accurate number. And the man who originated that number does not stand by it. But that's the kind of mistakes that are made. I haven't been informed of any mistakes so far. Instead, a man has simply proclaimed with his whole chest that he has no idea how biology works. So we're talking about vestigial organs, we're talking about, about mistakes, bad design. One more, there's a, there's a whole field, you should look this up, this is absolutely fascinating, bioengineering. Bioengineering is where engineers want to build something, they look into the biological world how the biological world performs that function, and they get inspirations to how to build something that will do it, because very often the biological world does it best, or at least far better than they can do without it and can, than they can imagine. Well, yeah, evolution has had millions of years to work on most functions, but I'm not sure why this is evidence against evolution and not for it. Maybe he'll clarify. Um, a lot of this is on discovery.org. Now, when your friends tell you, oh, that's a creationist site, you tell them that you're just bitterly protesting you're bitterly prejudiced. Go back to your prejudices and leave me alone. I want to understand the world. And then your friend can tell you that they have a demonstrable history of publishing verifiable falsehoods. Now, that doesn't mean you can simply dismiss anything on the site, as that would be the genetic fallacy. But what it does mean is that you should always fact check anything anyone sends you from them. And they have a lot of very good scientific information there. I think I just broke my X button. Um, certain animals and certain fish, when they move forward, wiggle. They wiggle, they waffle as they move forward. Engineers will tell you that's dumb. Uh, you're moving against the medium, especially fish, you're moving against the medium. The sleeker you are, the more streamlined you are, the less resistance you get from the medium. If you waffle, you're going to create more resistance. It's going to slow you down. So it's just bad design. So they thought. I've never, to my knowledge, heard anyone say that anguilliform swimming is bad design. In fact, it allows for lots of maneuverability, although it limits speed. But if you need maneuverability more than speed, it's a good way to swim. It's also written in all the engineering textbooks that there are two competing features, and the more you improve one, the more you lose in the other. One is speed, and one is maneuverability. While that is true, and is what I just said, I don't think that's in all or even most engineering textbooks. I doubt any electrical engineers are worried about electron maneuverability. The faster you go, the less maneuverable you are. That's an axiom in engineering textbooks. Guess what? If you move with a wiggle, you can improve both of them simultaneously. I mean, you can wiggle faster, but you'll never reach the speeds that you could with, say, thuniform swimming in the water like a tuna, whose name literally means fast, or a more rigid spine on land, like those of mammals or dinosaurs. They discovered that by watching the way fish move. So the engineering textbooks are wrong, 
It's possible to improve both speed and maneuverability simultaneously if you put in a wiggle. And now they're engineering wiggles. It's always been known that both can be improved to a point, but you will run up against boundaries in which improvement in one area comes at the expense of the other. The Concorde supersonic passenger jet is not going to be as maneuverable as a stunt plane. And of course, there are other concerns like acceleration, mass, etc. that affect both maneuverability and speed. It's not just simply that there's a simple linear relationship between them, but there are trade-offs between them in many cases. Engineering texts aren't wrong about that. Um, if evolution is just carrying along all the past junk and making improvements that on whole give you better survival, but of course carry along a lot of failures at the same time, then this, this, um, this field of bioengineering it's not going to get a lot. It's going to run out of stuff because lots and lots of stuff in the human body is badly designed. Yes, it is. And some of it isn't. That's why engineers are looking at things like the human eye lens and iris, but are also not putting the electrical connections for their light sensors and cameras in front of the sensors and leaving a blind spot in the camera. It's almost like humans can look at biology, see what works well, and what only works well enough, and then copy the former while improving on the latter. That biology has come up with highly efficient mechanisms in some organisms in some contexts doesn't negate poor design in other parts of those same organisms. It turns out that this claim of bad design is something which um, is, is just when you learn the details and, and look at the new discoveries, they're learning now that, at least in some cases, the coding of the DNA can be read forwards and backwards. As far as I'm aware, it's only in bacteria which have much smaller, more compact, and simpler genomes than eukaryotes. So it's the kind of place where you might expect that to work. Bacteria can't really afford the cost of lots of junk DNA, and they can easily pay the price of selection given how rapidly they produce. So it makes sense for them to be under heavy selection for the most compact and efficient genomes possible, which is what they tend to have. We need four ways of code for one thing. We need the same thing backwards of code for something else. Can you write a code that's read forwards and backwards? I don't know. I've never tried. But even if I can't, that says nothing about the ability of mutation and selection to do so, since neither of them are bound by my coding ability. Show me a computer science code that's read, that, read in that way. Show me a computer science code that codes simultaneously for 20 different things. DNA isn't a computer, and it isn't read the same way, and it isn't written the same way. So this is an irrelevant comparison. You can't do that. Biology does it. Does it look like a kludge? Does it look like 96% of the thing is all junk? Non sequitur, your facts are uncoordinated. It does in fact look like most of it is junk in this human genome. Yes, the fact that bacteria have less junk and have reversible regions in their genomes in no way means that the human genome is more functional than we have evidence for. I can't even imagine how this is supposed to follow. It doesn't look like that. Now if evolution tells me there ought to be a lot of junk, which there verifiably is, even according to David's own source, and code. Evolution trumpeted the 96% uh, of uh, junk DNA as a very strong argument that evolution is true. What should they say when it turns out not to be correct? That's a counterpoint against previous models, and those models need updating or even tossing out. But of course, that hasn't proved correct, and the amount of non-functional DNA in humans is right in line with predictions. I think they should say, well, then, um, we weren't right about that. You weren't right about that? That makes you reduce your confidence that you're right altogether. Sure. But again, this alleged correction has yet to happen. And remember, the best evidence we've seen so far that it has is a 2012 paper that the authors didn't even stand by for two years. Now, the, on the other side, to say that... Um, since there are faults in the design of the body, if there are faults, if you can demonstrate there are faults, that proves that it's not, not uh, the result of a, of a creator. Um, there's a missing premise here. Is the premise that the creator doesn't suck? I bet that's it. It may be obvious, but it was just one little piece of background. There's a good philosopher named Peter Van Inwagen. Never heard of him, but that doesn't matter much. He was a religious Christian philosopher. He's done work in general philosophy and in philosophy of religion. And he made the following observation, which I think is, I don't say true, but it's, it's very important. If you want to arrive at a religious conclusion, in your premise somewhere, you've got to have a religious premise. 
You can't start with purely scientific material and arrive at a religious conclusion. I would replace the word religious with supernatural, but I guess I won't immediately reject this point, although I'd probably need to read more of his argument to really assess it. Intuitively, though, it seems reasonable. In the argument for a religious conclusion, there's got to be some religious premise somewhere. Otherwise, you're not talking about the right subject. Sort of like um, uh, doing chemistry and arriving at a conclusion in art criticism. <laughs> chemistry alone is not going to give you a conclusion in art criticism. Okay, now, how is this one supposed to work? Well, the idea is there's bad design in the body, and God is capable of much better design. So, what? There shouldn't be bad design in the body? Yes, as long as we assume that if God exists, he doesn't suck. If God designed it, there shouldn't be bad design in the body? Because he's capable of much better design? Surely that's incomplete. I don't do everything I'm capable of doing to you. No, but I'm not usually held to be omnipotent, omniscient, or omnibenevolent. So, you know, I do kind of suck compared to most monotheistic conceptions of what God's supposed to be like. Maybe David believes in a much smaller God than that who does kind of suck. Of course, that leaves the design argument rather unfalsifiable, which means it has no place in science. Do you everything, do everything that you can do? No, you have to know also what you want to do. If you want to do it and you're capable of doing it, then presumably, under normal circumstances, you should do it. So what? God wanted to give humans horrible back pain as a bit of a goof? What a dick. The fact that God is capable of it doesn't conflict with bad design. You have to know that he wants to avoid bad design. Do you know that? I don't, but it's the presumption that you come to when you ask most monotheists what their God is like. How do you know that? What do you know about God? Well, I'm no theologian, but when someone tells me that God is all-powerful, all-knowing, and fundamentally good to the point that what good is can be defined as what accords to God's nature, I assume that he didn't just give people back pain for the lulls. You're a biologist? You don't know anything about God. I don't know about that. I think there are some very theologically savvy biologists out there. On the other hand, this guy who seems to be very into theology seems to know about as much about biology as he thinks biologists know about God. You got a clue about God. How can you derive your conclusion that God didn't do it? I can't, and I don't say that God didn't do it. I just note that none of the predictions made on that basis that are different from the predictions of science have borne out. And so there's no reason to include God in the theoretical framework of evolutionary biology. If God did it, then he did it in exactly the way we expect to see if he didn't do it. Which is fine, maybe he did. I just don't care when it comes to science, because that's unfalsifiable and outside the scope of science. You have to know whether God would want to, pro to produce perfectly designed artifacts or not. That's just a piece of logic. From my point of view, the premise is false. Because one of the major understandings of how God relates to the world is that he hides his presence, doesn't show his presence. Which maybe is why he doesn't come up in biology. That being the case, to find things which look like bad design, for us would be natural. We would expect that. We wouldn't expect God to have everything turned out nat so seemingly naturally with perfect design. If that were so, it was just obvious that some superior intelligence was doing it. So God just arranged everything to look like it evolved, and then made it so evolution operates in the present in ways that it can account for the evident history. You know what the only reasonable course of action is in that case? It's to accept evolution. All the evidence points to it, even under the divine hiddenness excuse. So you can't get to an argument against God's design from pointing out failures in the design of the body for two reasons. Number one, you haven't got any failures in the design of the body that you can point to that you know for sure, given the ones that they've lost recently. I disagree, but whatever. And second of all, that would require information about God that, that you don't have. But this is a, a whole area um, where um, they made predictions and, re and relied on this evidence and it turns out not to be correct. Um, this guy needs to ramble less. I don't even know what predictions he's claiming aren't correct. I think he's even lost himself. I guess I'll, give you, I'll give you one more uh, example. One more example would be a total of one example. And then we'll, uh, we'll quit. There are holes in the fossil record. 
big holes, like I said, insects, flowering plants. Which aren't really the big holes that he says they are, but we've covered that. And yeah, the fossil record is imperfect, and no one seriously thinks otherwise. There's a giant hole <clears throat> between the ancestor of the whale and the whale. Okay, here's a chart of stem whales. I don't see a big hole. Do you? The ancestor of the whale is supposed to be some smallish land creature, something like a fox. You mean like Ichthyolestes, a fox-sized artiodactyl, mostly typical of Eocene artiodactyls? Okay, got it. Something like a fox. Now, if you look on the websites recently, the last couple of years, they're trumpeting that they have intermediaries and so forth and so on. They even have a leg bone in a whale. Well, what a leg bone be doing in a whale if it didn't come from something that had legs and needed legs? Good question, but I guess since David can just say, well, God is a dick and he was having a goof, he can unfalsifiably dismiss any vestigial organs. But first of all, how many intermediaries would you like between something like a fox and a whale? I don't know, four? Fortunately, I've got organisms like Ichthyolestes, Ambulocetus, Remingtonocetus, Protocetus, Bacillosaurus, and Dorodon, which is six, and only a tiny but representative fraction of the fossil cetaceans we know of. Two? Twenty-two? How about fifty? As that's how many stem whale species I can find as having been described just checking Wikipedia. Of course, I know that a new one was described recently as of the time of this writing, Perucetus colossus. So I guess fifty-one seems fine. It's certainly more than 21. Let's see if Dave goes full Dr. Banjo. 222 between a fox and a whale. <sighs> the, the, the difference is so gigantic. 2,222? You want lots and lots and lots. Okay, I'm waiting for 41. Well, we've got at least 51, so problem solved. 41? I think that's a small enough, reasonable number. Show me 41 different spread out on the spectrum between a fox and a whale. Okay, here we go. 1. Pachycetus inacus. 2. P. Ataki. 3. P. Calcis. 4. P. Chittus. 5. Nalocetus ratimitus. 6. Ichthyolesis pinfoldi. 7. Ambulocetus natans. 8. Gondacasia potens. 9. Himalayacetus subathuensis. 10. Androsiphius sloani. 11. Atocacetus precursor, 12, Delanestes ahmedi, 13, Cuchacetus minimus, 14, Remingtonocetus harudiensis, 15, R. domandiensis, 16, Agacetus gehenne, 17, Babiacetus indicus, 18, B. misrahi, 19, Carolinacetus gingerechi, 20, Georgiacetus vogtlensis, 21, Nachitochia jonesi, 22, Papiocetus lugardi, 23, Pontobacillus tuberculatus, 24, Macaracetus bidens, 25, Aegyptocetus tarfi, 26, Ardiocetus clavis, 27, Cronatocetus rayi, 28, Datacetus hyeni, 29, Gravacetus razai, 30, Indocetus romani, 31, Myocetus ineus, 32, Peregocetus pacificus, 33, Kaiserocetus arifi, 34, Rhodocetus kasrani, 35, R. Balochistonsensis, 36, Bacillosaurus setoides, 37, B. Isis, 38, Bacilloteris husseini, 39, Eocetus schweinfurthi, 40, Ancalocetus simonsi, and 41, Bacillotritis uheni. Just for fun, here are some known proto whale genera I left out Cryocetus, Synthiocetus, Dorudon, Masrocetus, Okukahea, Pontogenius, Sagacetus, Stromerius, Supiacetus, Zygoriza, Anteocetus, Pachycetus, Perucetus, Platypus, and Cachinodon. I think I've met the requirement. This also means that I missed my estimate by forgetting at least 14 species. So I guess it's more like 65 minimum. And I say minimum because I'm not checking how many more of those genera I forgot to count that have multiple species. They're not dreaming of that. Baloney. You know, they don't have to dream about it. We have it and then some. Number one. And number two, they tell you about the leg bone. Then let me tell you a very sad story. 
Um, is it the sad story of how some guy couldn't understand biology, never looked into fossil whales, and doesn't know what leg bones are or how to recognize them? You probably heard that the dinosaurs went extinct. I have heard that. It's not true, but I've heard it. That's not true. That's not true, or at least the theory that it's not true goes up and down. Every five or ten years it shifts, right? Because, according to many, the birds are dinosaurs. Oh, I wonder if he has counter evidence for that for us. The birds came from the dinosaurs, and the dinosaurs never went extinct. They just evolved into the birds. That is to say, the flying dinosaurs evolved into the birds. And the Tyrannosaurus rexes, you know, lost that. Did birds come from dinosaurs or not? Yes. Every five years there's a change in, uh, a change in mind about this, and each one calls the other side's ignoramuses and so on and so on. No, there's a group of like six people led by Alan Fiducia who, among paleontologists, are the lone heldouts against the idea that birds are dinosaurs, and who publish papers contra mundi that are routinely savaged in the literature because they ran out of good ideas when it was demonstrated that the bird madness digits are in fact 1, 2, and 3, and not 2, 3, and 4, as had been previously believed. I have an article from a fellow named Larry Martin who wrote uh, an article. Now, this is in an extinct journal called The Sciences. But if you want to find it, you can find the quotation in my... Uh, you can find it on Google. You can find just look up um, Larry Martin, The Sciences, and you know, put it in quotation marks, and they'll, they'll, they'll get it for you. And in it, he's... Uh, talking about the relationship between the dinosaur predecessors and the birds that, ca that came from them. And he's reviewing a book that says there are 85 anatomical features in common. 85 features. Man, that's a lot of features. Yeah, it's kind of like the thing that might, in another context, convince you that whales are mammals which despite not knowing anything about fossil whales, I didn't hear this guy deny. Also, I did Google what he told me to, and it didn't show up. Although there was a Larry Martin, who was a paleontologist who died in 2013, presumably that's who he's talking about. That's a lot of features. 85 features in common? That's pretty convincing. I mean, even I as a layman, as an outsider, 85 features. Yeah, but you see, uh, he is one of the world's experts on uh, prehistoric birds, and he decided to do a detailed examination. And he says that to his shock, in investigating every one of the 85, not one held up! Not one out of 85 held up! Not one out of 85! Loud noises! Remember, kids, screaming like an insane person predicting the end of the world on the street corner makes you more believable. But anyway, Larry Barton was one of the bandits, the aforementioned group led by Alan Fiducia, who decided to just deny that birds are dinosaurs down to the point of basically lying. I can't find this article, but I will say that he and company have not moved the consensus at all, and instead have basically ruined their own careers. But let's look at some of the anatomical features of birds that are diagnostic of dinosauria. We have the open acetabulum, the sensacrum, the more than three sacral vertebrae, the asymmetrical fourth trochanter of the femur, the femoral head offset from the shaft and turned medially, and more that I won't list for the sake of time. Such poor attention to detail, he writes, and such uh, imaginative false reconstruction went into it that not one of the 85 holds up. Except that they do, or at least enough of them do. I still can't find this paper, but I listed enough on their own that do hold up positively to identify birds as dinosaurs, and that's just from the hips down. Now that's pretty shocking. That's pretty shocking. No, what's shocking is that David thinks that a paper he can't even properly cite from a journal that stopped publishing in 2001 and that has been roundly rejected by the consensus of experts is somehow a gotcha against one of the most well-established taxonomic realities in vertebrate paleontology. Now you ask me, why do I pledge allegiance to Larry Martin? I don't. I don't. But if one group says they have 85 features in common, and the other group says you have none, something's wrong. Yeah, and what's wrong is that one of the sides has lost all of its arguments and barely exists at all. But David here likes them more. So he just takes their decades-old papers at face value and, again, 
Remember, kids, yelling and punching things makes you seem smarter. Something's desperately wrong. The method is not a good method. Your analysis is not a good analysis. Your way of drawing conclusions is not a good way of drawing conclusions. Something's desperately wrong. It was 85 to 0. And David never thought that maybe it was the non-consensus side that might have been the problem. Can I trust that? Trust what? The consensus? Yeah, probably. A handful of people who haven't been taken seriously in more than 20 years? Probably not. Now along came these same people and said, we found a leg bone in a whale. Well. Hey, fun fact, the overlap between people working on Mesozoic archosaurs and those working on fossil stem whales is basically zero. So it's not the same people. Maybe yes, and maybe no. I don't know. You don't know either. I do actually know, because unlike David, I make it a point to actually read paleontology literature, like the actual peer-reviewed papers, and I make it a point to actually make sure I understand them. He doesn't know, but what he does know is that because some other group of people confirmed his bias, he can reject the unrelated work on whales. You know, for a guy with a doctorate in mathematical logic, he sure is bad at logic. You're guessing, and you're strongly influenced by your desire to preserve evolution, so you say it's a leg bone. So here's a skeleton of a Bacillosaurus, complete with hips and legs. You tell me what that is, if not legs. And of course, even modern whales have leg bones, so it's not like we're depending on paleontology for the idea that whales have and had legs. Do you know everything that goes on in the whale body? No, I do not, but I know that this is a whale embryo with a hind limb bud just like the embryonic hind limb bud of any other amniote, and that from it grows the internal leg and hip bones of modern whales. So I know enough to say with complete confidence that even modern whales have leg bones. Do you know all the functions that it fulfills? Can't say that I do, but it's still a leg that develops from the hind limb bud, which is kind of what makes it a leg. Maybe in the embryological stage it fulfills a, first, a crucial function in developing the embryo in a certain way, and it's just carried along later. Actually, yes, it did develop in the embryo, as I've shown, and it specifically developed in the hind limb buds, which, you know, are the things that produce hind legs, making this a hind leg. How do you know that it's a useless leg bone coming from a previous, a previous uh, incarnation? Well, I don't know that it's useless, and I'm not claiming that it is, but I know it's a leg bone because of how it develops, and I know that it came from an ancestral leg because we have the dozens of transitional fossils showing the reduction of the hind limbs. We have exactly what David is asking for. He just apparently never bothered to check and see that, in fact, we have what he wants to be convinced. Of course, I suspect that even if he were made aware of this fact, he'd move the goalposts. Absolutely no, uh, no reason to trust, to trust something like that. Yeah, why trust physical evidence when you could just trust some shouty old man who has a dubious at best grasp on both reality and logic? A lot is made out of sim similar forms, especially similar forms that perform different functions. Hey, he said the whale thing was the last thing. No fair. The pentadactyl form. You have five fingers, remember? And five toes. Aw, I have less than that. I feel left out. Golly, how come? Well, the answer is certain animals have five digits on their, on their uh, legs, their feet. And certain fish have in their flippers five digits, five bones. By the horns of Moshe, no. The pentadactyl arrangement does not come from fish fins, but from stem tetrapods. Some of the transitional stegocephalians between what we'd call fish and tetrapods have more digits, 
Animals like Acanthostega have eight digits. Ichthyostega had seven, and the pentadactyl limb is something that evolved after legs became legs and stopped being fins. In fact, stegocephalian fins had many more than five rays. This is just David making shit up. Clearly, the five fish digits evolved into the five animal digits, which evolved into the five human digits. It was carried along. If I only had a brain. Especially since the assumption is five isn't particularly best number for doing the different things they do. They do, after all, very different things. The flippers push water, and the uh, feet are for walking on, and the hand is for grasping things. They're very different functions. No particular reason why five would be the best number for doing all those things. It was just carried along. Okay, you have five fingers because of your DNA. Mostly yes, although there are environmental factors that can affect that. Just check out thalidomide birth defects to see some environmental variation on that, but only do it if you can look at deformities comfortably. So do animals have five digits because of their DNA? So do the fish have five bones in their flippers because of their DNA? Well, except that they don't, but okay. If we really got our digits from the animals, and the animals got it from the fish, then you ought to be able to see in the DNA, similar DNA that's carried along from stage to stage. Um, yes, you should, and you can. In fact, digit and fin ray growth are both controlled by Hox genes, which are some of the most conserved genes in all of Bilateria. And you can find homologous Hox genes in fruit flies and humans. Indeed, read Neil Shubin's Your Inner Fish, because he has a whole chapter on how the same Hox genes that affect digit development affect ray development in fish, including fish as far as tetrapods as sharks and rays. In fact, it was such an investigation that finally shut down the last decent argument from the bandits, as I've already pointed out, about the digits in the bird hand. If that's where we got it from, and the DNA is what produces it, then the DNA ought to be similar from stage to stage. But it isn't. It isn't analogous. That's true. It isn't analogous. It's homologous. Specifically because it's an inherited trait. It isn't homologous. Ah, uh, yes it is. And numerous experiments have shown this. The DNA that produces it is different and not, not related in the, in the cases. Not for any relationship that we can see. Saying it more doesn't make it more true. So then, this looks like evidence against pulling it along from the previous. You say, but if you didn't pull it along from the previous, where could it possibly have come from? Well, remember Ernst Meyer, the eye evolved independently 40 times in the history of life. 40 independent times. Nobody says, oh no, it's a string of 40. This one took it from this one, took it from this one, took it from this one. Nobody says that because they know that lines are distinct. But they don't say that for vertebrates. All vertebrate eyes are indeed homologous, so this analogy fails. So you have something called convergent evolution. Convergent evolution means similar structures arise in different lines. So you say, where did the five come from? In the fish and the animals and in us? Maybe it arose independently. Okay, so let's say that it did even though we know for very good reasons that it didn't. I don't think pointing to an example of convergent evolution is an argument against evolution. That's kind of like me pointing to David here as an argument that Jews don't exist. It doesn't really work. We don't have to say that similar structure. There are um, pouched mammals in North and South America. There are pouched mammals in Australia. Did they cross the ocean to get from one to the other? No, they evolved in Gondwana, which was a supercontinent composed of South America, Antarctica, and South America at the time they evolved. And fossil marsupials have been found in Antarctica confirming this. The only marsupial in North America is the Virginia opossum, and it only entered North America after it and South America were connected via the Isthmus of Panama. Biogeography is not something anti-evolutionists usually go into because of how hard it is for them to account for versus how easy it is for science to account for. Pangea is too old for that. Correct, but Gondwana is not. So, obviously, pouchedness arose twice. It arose twice independently. Nope, it did not. Marsupials are monophyletic and evolved in Gondwana. Eutherian mammals, that is placental mammals, are also monophyletic and evolved in Laurasia. This is pretty basic history of mammal stuff. So why must I think that my five digits came from the animals and the animals came from the fish? because there is copious genetic, embryological, and fossil evidence for it, 
and exactly zero contra evidence, but also feel free to not believe in it. Just don't pretend that you can disprove the science. Especially when the DNA doesn't show it. Okay, I hope you get the, the gist of it. it it's just, it's just, um... It's just a long rant from a man who couldn't possibly be more ignorant of the topics he's talking about. There's lots and lots of critical stuff, but as I said at the outset, my goal tonight is not to show that it's false. My goal is to show that there isn't enough support to uh, rationally believe that it's true. And the talk was a miserable failure by either metric. At the very best, a person could say, we don't know if it's true or not. It's a research program, and it's, uh, we can get government grants to study it, and we can write books, and, you know, if you're Richard Dawkins, you could... You know what Richard Dawkins did at Oxford? His chair was in the public understanding of science. He's not a research scientist. He didn't do research science. Hey, fun fact, evolutionary biology isn't based on how cool Dawkins is. His, his, his uh, profession was the public understanding of science, explaining science to the layman. That explains, but doesn't justify, some of the gross errors that he made. Um, read Stephen Jay Gould on, on Richard Dawkins. Um, scathing, scathing attack on his incompetence. At any rate, I'm just illustrating to you that Anybody who tells you that if you don't believe in the theories of evolution, you're irrational, you're dogmatist, you're out of, out of, out of tune with the times, you don't, you're an ignoramus, is absolutely incorrect. The, the opposite is correct. Actually, no. Most people who reject evolution are dogmatists or ignoramuses. Some of them are just liars, though. Andrew Stelling comes to mind, although he's also a dogmatist. Anybody who believes it is a dogmatist. He's not willing to look at the data. He's not willing to look at the arguments and the logic. You mean all the data that continuously had been confirming the theory of evolution for over a century? Okay. And remember, when David actually laid out what would count as confirmation of whale evolution, it was trivially easy to demonstrate. So even by his own absurd standard of evidence for evolution, it's true. And as you see in the wars on the blogs, the believers in evolution use um, character assassination, insult. One guy... Stephen Meyer is a writer in this area. He has a PhD in philosophy of science from Cambridge University. Not too bad, I would say. Look, man, the number of times I've seen creationists tell me that people who teach evolution are actually under the influence of Satan means that I no longer care if a person who doesn't reject science called you a bad name, especially when so many of them do evidently apply to many creationists. And he wrote a book called Signature in the Cell about the information in the cell and how it, it can't be explained in in evolutionary terms, and one guy writes, this book is junk. It's so bad I didn't read it. Seriously, a second topic after we were told the whale thing was the final thing, and of course, many people have read Signature in the Cell, and it was junk, which is why it made absolutely zero impact on biology. Of course, it wasn't meant to. It was meant to reassure dogmatic young earth creationists that their delusions about science are actually true. Apparently, it did the same thing for some orthodox Jews. You're saying it's so bad you didn't read it? And he's not embarrassed. He's not embarrassed by that. I would have thought any self respecting person wouldn't say in the same breath that it's junk and he didn't read it. He's not embarrassed by that. That's the level of debate coming from their side. Is it though? Because I can't help but notice that this alleged reviewer hasn't been identified at all, which means that as near as I can tell, he doesn't exist. And there's absolutely no way I'm trusting David say so, given how bad he's been at getting things right. That's the level of discussion coming from their side. It's crude in the extreme. Thomas Nagel, because he made a couple of remarks favorable to, to ID, got the same treatment. Uh, it's, it's an embarrassment to the academic world that, uh, that people do that. And the people who are supporting intelligent design and uh, criticizing evolution, by and large, are, are keeping a very low interpersonal profile. Yeah. What go, do you go, want go, me? go, go, go! You don't do it! You Why? just talk, talk, Why? talk! Yeah, sure they are. Also, is this whole point just tone policing? They're presenting the arguments, they're presenting the evidence, they're presenting the information. Yeah, they'll point out the foils of it, but there's no character assassination, so just simply they're pointing it out. No character assassination. Got it. And there's lots and lots and lots of it. So I think that the bottom line is there's certainly not enough reason to believe that the theory of evolution is true. Okay, well, that's where it ends with tone policing, which I find very unpersuasive. 
especially given how much yelling and banging on the table David did. I know he's not a Christian, but still, he might want to take the plank out of his own eye before complaining about the speck in the eyes of evolutionary biologists and science communicators. Anyway, if you enjoyed the video, hit like and tell me in the comments. If you didn't, feel free to hit dislike and tell me what the problem was in the comments. Either way, please remember to subscribe and hit the bell icon so you're always notified when I have more content. I'm the Dapper Dinosaur. Hey, before you leave, I just want to take a second to thank my patrons and channel members, especially those pledging $20 or above. Ben Tovind, Tapioca Weasel, Whispers, Kelvin Brostick Van Manen, Denny5252, Eleron Teller, Phil Favara, Ian Chen, Landon Knoll, Mavity Babby, Monkey They Them, Mrs. Spexinder, The Venerable Bead, Sphincter of Doom, and Star Runner. It's because of my channel members and patrons whom you're seeing on screen that this channel can stay afloat. Without you, it would all shut down. If you want to join the team, there's a link to join the channel below this video, and there's a link to join the Patreon in the description. On the Patreon, you can get a 10% discount for pledging annually, and either way, you get early access to virtually all of my scripted videos, often three to five months before they come out for the general public. Thanks for watching.